uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director, uh, and and uh, I think the biggest welcome of all uh, to the youth that are on the platform. I see we've got 27 people already in the, in the session, so uh, you are in fact the most important people. I want to acknowledge you up front. So so, so uh, thank you for joining us, and I really hope that uh, we can have a productive discussion. Um, I want to also acknowledge uh, you and Habitat. Um, who are partnering with us in hosting this webinar. Uh, you know, UN Habitat has been a partner that has worked with our city uh, on, on many occasions in many different areas, and we, we certainly value uh, the involvement uh, and uh, uh, drive to, to create a, the sort of society that, uh, that, that, we, that the world needs, and, and we in South Africa in particular. I'd really like to acknowledge the, the presence and the representatives that are in the meeting and, and uh, say a big thank you for all that you do to help us uh, in, in Itekweni. We've also got representatives from the South African Institute of International Affairs uh, on the youth program uh, who are responsible for the Youth Climate Action Plan. And uh, I want to thank them for, for joining us. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get uh, a lot of valuable uh, inputs from them, uh, and it's great to have them here as, as part of the seminar. Uh, we have the University of KwaZulu Natal uh, partner with us on, on many different initiatives, and uh, I want to thank them in particular for being here. And, and again, I'm sure there's a, a, a rich contributions that uh, will come from, from, from those representatives as well. Uh, senior management from Itekwini that are here. Uh, I want to acknowledge them and welcome them uh, uh, for taking the time to, to join this important session. Um, and again, I'm sure they, they, they will contribute uh, richly. I know in particular, our manager climate change adaptation uh, is here, uh, was, was joining us today. I think Sean is here, Sean O'Donoghue. So thank you for joining us. And I, I think it's, it's gonna be very important uh, that you share and, and make inputs in relation to our strategy within the city. Uh, Innovate Durban, I know they've got load shedding, but uh, they've managed to join us. I heard uh, someone talking a little bit earlier. Uh, welcome Innovate Durban, and we look forward to your contributions. And then, uh, hi Suzanne, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and then all, all other many colleagues and guests that have joined us today, um, I, I want to uh, thank you. And if I've missed out anybody in particular, uh, let me just say a big and a huge welcome to everybody for, for joining us on this, uh, this important uh, platform and this important discussion that we have here today. So, so obviously, as a city, um, and I think uh, our program director set the tone very well at the start. Uh, I think, you know, we, we all know uh, uh, that, that uh, you know, we're talking about this topic is, is about uh, uh, social justice uh, into the future uh, and and uh, how climate change is something that we, you know, we, we, we don't, don't focus only on the present uh, and the issues that we face uh, as communities communities uh, in, the, uh, in the present, but we also focus on, on uh, the need for us to create an environment that uh, our children and our children's children can, can, uh, uh, can, can, can prosper and thrive in. Uh, and, uh, you know, so when we're looking at, um, at the issue of uh, equity, uh, uh, let's uh, bear in mind that it's got, uh, you know, it's also got a longitudinal uh, ask of all of us, uh, and uh, those of you know certainly we benefited from, uh, and and maybe also to some extent disbenefited from from decisions that have been taken in the past. And our real task here is to make sure that we take the decisions that are are going to uh, be decisions that uh, would enable uh, our future. Um, and and, and the, our children, our children's children, to to have a an environment where they can be the best that they can be, and uh, and I think that's extremely important. Um, so so this is an important discussion, and we're very excited that the, uh, we've got the youth joining us here, um, and we're looking forward to the the invaluable inputs. Uh, 
we this is one, one of the events that we are hosting to com commemorate uh, October being the uh, urban month. Uh, and the theme is adapting cities for climate resilience. Uh, and it's in, in, in our preparations for, for um, uh, uh, UN Habitat. Uh, we, we felt that it was important that we have a session with, with the youth uh, and that we are able to explore and listen to, to, to what they've got to say about uh, uh, you know, a world, create, uh, making sure that we, we have a world that's, uh, that's there for the, for the future. Uh, we are hoping that these discussions will will uh, result in some concrete uh, long term um, actions that we all can focus on col collectively, um, and that uh, we 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 can start to move beyond uh, trying to understand what what needs to be done and start focusing more on on doing the things that need to get done. Uh, innovation is important. Uh, you know, we we at the turn of the century, uh, we we faced a situation where we were taking more out of the environment than the environment was able to 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 replace. Uh, and when you have a situation like that, where 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 the demands and the needs uh, are so huge and and uh, and and uh, you know daunting, uh, you know innovation is is going to be one of the key key things that we would need to focus on to make sure that we we, we start to see and, and and enable the difference that we need to enable. We've also got representatives, uh, as I said, from the South African Youth Climate Action Plan, uh, who helped to develop the first South African Youth Climate Action Plan, uh, which is now a framework uh, that, that is used to inspire youth-led action. So we, we're glad to have them here, and I think there's going to be some invaluable uh, inputs that come from 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 this side as well. We are also reminded about the SDGs and the need to make sure that we all do our our bit to uh, achieve the sustainable development goals, in particular goals 13, 11, and 9 uh, are relevant to this uh, seminar that we're having here today. Uh, and it's important that we, when we focus on these uh, goals and the and the indicators associated with these goals. That we are able to come out of that uh, uh, engagement with a strengthened uh, climate uh, resilience. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I thought. Am I yeah, taking too long? Sorry. You can still go ahead, Mr. Peters. Is fine. Okay. okay. All right. I think it's uh, intimidating. Uh, so, so obviously those, those. Goals are important for us, and we've got to come out of this discussion with a very concrete understanding of how we can improve uh, the way in which we contribute to those particular goals. Uh, uh, goal 11 uh, and indicator 11B is also important around inclusive, safe, resilience, and 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 uh, sustainable um, cities, uh, and that calls for us to make sure that we we implement, we identify the policies and the plans towards inclusion resource efficiency, mitigation, adaptation, uh, and that we, we build those into, into our action plans moving forward. Uh, there's also an innovation component in our discussion, which is linked to SDG 9, uh, building resilient uh, infrastructure, promoting sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. We also think that that goal is particularly, particularly relevant to this uh, discussion today. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, we are taking the opportunities to, to uh, you know, once we respond to the economic pressures uh, uh, relating to our social realities, uh, that we're doing so in a way that uh, is is uh, moving the planet uh, to a more sustainable trajectory, uh, but is also responding at the same time to some of the the socioeconomic realities that we that we are faced with. So our, our, our long-term goal is to is to make sure that we establish a youth platform, uh, and I think this is a, 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 an important starting point in that discussion. A youth platform uh, that can support ongoing youth involvement, youth innovation, uh, and um, uh, climate action uh, awareness and and active participation. Uh, and so we want to to uh, engage with various stakeholders 
to make sure that we have the ability to, to form the partnerships that will allow us to to to, to create a, a, a more resilient uh, uh, itequini and uh, in particular a, an, a, an itequini that is uh, conscious of the realities that we face with and is able to chart a meaningful, productive, resilient, sustainable uh, way forward. So just just in terms of the the uh, concept note every year, uh, as you all know, during October, uh, UN Habitat and, and Partners uh, organize activities associated with what we call Urban October. And we bring together a whole range of stakeholders from different uh, like, uh, academia, uh, tertiary institutions, uh, business, uh, civil society. Uh, you know, all, all important stakeholders in any community and that we bring together to try and, and uh, understand what issues are we, we collectively respond to these issues. Certainly in large cities, uh, what matters is not only and or necessarily what the municipality does. Uh, what matters is is uh, is really how uh, a range of stakeholders can come together around uh, making sure that uh, uh, that city works for everybody, both now and into the future. And so uh, that's an important uh, time frame, an important platform uh, for us to to redouble our efforts, not just to look at uh, October as a month where we focus on 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 urban issues, but uh, where we we focus more particularly perhaps on urban areas uh, issues because we need to do that, uh, uh, you know, as an ongoing uh, task, not just uh, in a particular month of the year. Uh, so, so this webinar in conjunction with UN Habitat is about focusing on youth innovation and, and climate action. Uh, and uh, as I said, the purpose is to to engage our youth. Uh, there's there's uh, a lot of excellent ideas out there. And it's really about, about the future that we're talking, and then so it's important, uh, very important stakeholder that we've got to to engage with. Uh, and again, I just want to welcome everybody to this uh, uh, to the session and the youth in particular. I think coming out of this uh, discussion, we should be able to strengthen our, our trust uh, between uh, civil society and government and make sure that there's more constructive and active engagement uh, and vigilance on the part of everybody around these important issues. We want to make sure that uh, citizens are actively involved and, and, and we want to encourage them to be involved. Um, we want to make sure that we, we create platforms for ongoing discussions. Uh, and I think that's something that we would want to look at as well. Uh, what, where and, and what and how do we create these platforms so that we don't just have, as I said, a discussion once a year, but that we have an ongoing engagement and discussion. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, that that we're promoting an open uh, government agenda uh, uh, so that uh, the reality of everybody getting involved and contributing is, is, uh, is realized. Uh, as I said, this is not something that can be done uh, by by uh, one stakeholder themselves, uh, you know, uh, whether it's a large metropolitan city or not, it, it, it comes from collective action. So, colleagues, let me let me stop there. I think I've gone over my time, uh, but once more, huge welcome. Uh, most importantly, to the youth that that are here, I see you as the most important participants, uh, and welcome our partners and our guests. And I also want to acknowledge the work done uh, by Bonga Musa and his team in putting the seminar together. Uh, I think it's 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 a sorely needed seminar and, and, and I'm hoping that we're going to have a lot of constructive and great ideas coming out of this discussion today. So welcome and I, I wish you a very fruitful, constructive, sustainable, resilient uh, uh, engagement session. Thank you, uh, Program Director. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. P uh, Mr. Peters, uh, for those uh, wonderful words of welcome and also painting a holistic picture in terms of how this particular work that we do uh, in our, allow me to say, in our small corners interface 
with the global picture that we want to paint in terms of the sustainable development goals. Uh, you have well articulated issues of goal 13, goal number 11, goal number 9, uh, which are very much important in the work that we do. And that also the goal of this particular engagement uh, is to have is to establish that part, the youth platform which will continuously work on issues of climate uh, change awareness as well as uh, climate change participation so this is a start of a great journey as i indicated earlier on thank you very much for your words of welcome uh, we really feel welcome and i'm sure young people also feel welcome thanks uh, to all the partners again uh, there will be a formal vote of thanks towards the end uh, but we acknowledge you inhabited the UKZN uh, as well as all other role players uh, that have worked together to ensure that we've got this webinar today. Without um, any waste of time, I'm going to briefly introduce our panel and, that we'll, and then we'll hit the ground running. I don't want to take a lot of time as moderator. I want to give our presenters and the young people an opportunity to engage uh, today. So um, I, I, I really want to, um, you know, we, we really want to hit the ground running. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Taban Gambo, as I indicated earlier, for those who joined late, uh, I just want to also say I'm Taban Gambo. I work for the Provincial Department of Economic Development, uh, uh, Tourism and Environmental Affairs in the province of KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, as an environment manager, I'm also attached to the climate change uh, unit uh, in the in the department. So I've got a very keen interest on in climate change management issues. Uh, so I work, work more in the policy context, uh, but also we do implementation to some degree. We also support local government uh, in climate change work as well as in environmental management work broadly. Uh, in our panel, we've got Mr. D. Ragan, uh, Mr. Doug Ragan. Uh, who is a, a program management officer for the Human Rights and Social Inclusion U, uh, a Unit in the United Nations Habitat. So he's gonna be he's, he's part of our panel. He has worked quite a lot with um, young people, children and youth in particular uh, at an international level. He's got over 30 years uh, of experience in that particular um, what you call a uh, section. So we've got a number of other speakers. I'll be introducing them as we move along and uh, I would request the speakers that are comfortable to switch on their cameras when they are presenting to please switch on their cameras. But I know other speakers have got connectivity issues. The bandwidth is not so great. So we will allow those speakers to have their cameras switched off whilst they are presenting. But those who have got a stronger bandwidth, um, or connectivity, um, then we will request them to switch on their cameras. So we've got Mr. Ragan, as I've indicated, we've got Nomfundo Shelembe in our panel. Nomfundo is a PhD candidate in the School of Agriculture, Earth and, and Environmental Sciences in the University uh, of KwaZulu Natal. I'm just introducing the panel briefly, but for each speaker, I will be uh, briefly going through their uh, brief bio as they are about to present. We've got also, uh, excuse me, Laeka, if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, you'll please correct me uh, when your turn comes. But we've got Laeka Martin, who is also a, an applied biology student in the University of Cape Town. Uh, thank you and welcome, uh, Laeka. We welcome Mr. Dark. Uh, we appreciate uh, you joining us. Uh, I just want to give this opportunity to you. Uh, we also have got uh, Mr. Joash Gavin Sami, and uh, we've got Olang Abeni, and we have got Mr. Asiago, uh, who is going to wrap up towards the end of the program. And uh, I just want to give this opportunity now to Mr. Ragan, uh, because uh, he maybe is pressed with time. So, Mr. Ragan, over to you, please. Uh, maybe give a better introduction of yourself than what I've given, and then uh, present to us uh, on issues of youth action on a global scale. Over to you, Sam. Thank you very much, uh, and I'm honored to be here. Um, like has been mentioned, I'm I'm phoning in from. Uh, uh, Cali, Colombia, actually, in a project that actually engages young people in climate change action. Um, we at UN Habitat are very honored to be able to 
work with the organizers here, as well as honored to be able to um, celebrate World Cities Day, Urban October. Um, we really believe that uh, obviously the cities are critical to uh, sustainable development, sustainable urbanization, but also they are the kind of the, the ground zero of climate change. The cities are one of the, uh, they're incredibly impactful in the area of climate change, both for good and bad. But what we're also seeing is that young people, especially young people in cities, urban young people, are the ones taking the lead globally. And so we're, we're, we're here to um, both discuss and celebrate that. I'm gonna quickly show my, am I, I'm gonna quickly show my slides. Um, sorry, just here, give me two seconds here. So I've got a brief slideshow, um, more on the lines of just some images. Uh, so can you see my slideshow? So let me just indicate so I know. Yes, I'm, we can see this. Thanks. Good, great. Thanks. So what I, this is a, the presentation I'm gonna make is really just celebrating some of the young people, many from Africa, but as well from all over the world that are taking the lead. It's not ironic and to kind of give you my non-youth credentials that um, almost uh, 30 years ago at the uh, Earth Summit in 1992, there was a young woman that stood up, uh, she was 12 years old, and she stopped the world. Um, her name was Severin Suzuki and began the conversation that we're still continuing now around environment and development, bringing together environmental issues with development issues that they no longer were separate, that they had to be considered collected. But what was I, what is, I guess, sadly in a way ironic was that um, this was a young woman of 12 years old. Uh, and now, you know, almost 30 years later, we see another young woman, Greta Thunberg, who's also standing up, speaking truth to power about the need to continue the discussion that was started almost 30 years ago by um, another young woman. And so I think it's, and so uh, you'll see in a lot of the slides that the young people, and many of them, again, young women, who are, um, have come forward to, to move this agenda and talking about the need for climate justice, the need for climate, uh, the, the need to make sure that everybody is um, addressed when we're talking about climate change, that it's not just a, a developed world issue, that it's not just the developed world that needs to uh, um, bring up the solutions. So this is Leah Namu Gerwa, she's a Fridays for Future, um, uh, founder in Uganda. She spoke as the keynote to the global celebrations of World Habitat Day this year in, in uh, Cameroon. And I mean, again, she just, she kind of encapsulates what young people are thinking is to, to sustain a better, just and more sustainable future. We have to come together for the planet through grassroots advocacy and create the change we need to see. So Leah, again, she started two years ago or three years ago with the Greta Thun, with as one of uh, people following Greta Thunberg, she um, kind of in, in, embodies uh, the, the young people that we're seeing coming forward. And she's an advocate both on the environmental side and the social justice side. And I think that's again, critical. And I keep coming back to this time and time again. And she also speaks a lot and as many of them do to the issues of ur urban urbanity and living in cities and climate change in cities. We just see that uh, with over 55, 60% now of the world living in cities and that growing, we have to address urban climate change. And it's the urban youth that are coming forward to do so. We, um, we, cities themselves that they, they are growing i mean we and we have to look at them as a a to make them a healthy ecosystem we must not just um assume that cities are equal negative environment or a bad environmental uh space to be we must make them livable we also must make sure that their their footprint is small 
Um, Leah has a project, uh, amazing project called Birthday Trees. If you Google Be Birthday Trees and Leah Namagerwa, and what she is committed to do, as many of these young climate activists do, is not just be a social media star, which Leah is, um, but as well, the she commits to action. And she her so so basically what she does is she plants trees on people's birthdays, and she's now planted tens of thousands of trees. And this is something, again, I think we see that these young activists, as we call them, are not just, they're, they're not just yelling, they're not just protesting, as, as many um, from certain areas will say that yet these young people are just protesters. They're not. They're really trying to find and embody the solutions that we're looking at. Um, um, we also see in... I, I work for I work for UN Habitat, obviously in the Human Rights and Social Inclusion Unit. One of the things we also see is this concept called intersectionality: the fact that many young people face have many different uh, identities, have many different ways of living, and this these intersect. So it's no longer just that it's a young woman, and and it's also sometimes these young women are Indigenous people, sometimes they're dis disabled. And they they have many different lenses and sometimes many different barriers to be successful. And one of the most successful young women in the climate change movement is Chie Bastida. Chie was spoke at our World Urban our, our uh, World Urban Forum in Kuala Lumpur for the first time. Again, she was at the time uh, 15 years old, and she is comes from or her father is also an activist. She speaks a lot about what I think we're hearing. Um, globally, that we need to look to people who are living closer to the land for solutions. It's no longer just a scientific fix that the, develop, the, the developed world or advanced science is going to solve, that we must look to the people who have lived close to the land. So in, in uh, many parts of the world, indigenous people, we also look very work very closely here with the Maasai. Uh, who are pastoralists, obviously, who live in um, the Serengeti slash uh, Maasai Mara. Uh, so, so these people know what it means to live in a sustainable way. And we must look to these people who have who've been hunt in, uh, living for hundreds of thousands of years uh, in harmony with the land, in harmony with the with our climate. So they 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 have the solutions. And I think Chie is definitely looking at that. And she also, again, brings that social justice lens as she addresses here. We can't, oftentimes we find that the, the, those people who are most impacted by environmental degradation, by climate change, are those who also are impacted socially, that they also are the ones that deal with racism, that they're also the ones that deal with uh, crushing poverty. Um, so we have to make sure that um, when we elevate everyone, that we also make sure that we elevate those who are most uh, impoverished. And again, GA also again is a, a strong advocate for indigenous people and it's and and pastoralists. And I think it's important that we we listen to them. As we all know, SDG 13, climate action, that's what we're looking at. And what we're looking, we're on the doorstep of, and what is important is that not only is it Urban October, not only is it World Cities Day uh, coming up very soon. Um, but it's COP, the climate change, the significant climate change event that happens every couple of years. Um, and this one is happening in Edinburgh. And at COP, we have, we are reviewing the SDGs and specifically SDG 13 and looking at how the commitments of the uh, world to, um, on the issues of climate change. And again, climate equity. The need to know that it is the developed world that is producing the massive amount of climate, uh, climate greenhouse gases, the massive amount and causing the, the massive amount of impact on the climate. And they must pay. They must also assist and work with the developing world to make sure that they, all, they are able to develop uh, in a sustainable way well as well. And it's not, this is sometimes the, um, there's a strong tension between the developed and the developing world that the, you know, people 
uh, oftentimes in these meetings will say, oh, you know, well, the developing world, they're doing this, they're doing that, and why shouldn't they pay themselves? And it's like, yes, but you need to look to the people who cause the most climate damage to be the ones that take the lead. And those, and also the, not when much of the developing world, much, and that developing world in Africa and, and such specifically, being massively young, I mean, 70% of the population in Africa is under the age of 30, we must look at ways that they are assisted and worked with um, to, so that they can develop clean energy technologies and they can develop um, in a way that doesn't, that allows their people to um, lift themselves up as well. And then it's not just reduce, recycle, reuse, and oh, you just, I mean, that just doesn't work in many parts of the world. So um, SDG 13 is something we're focusing on as we're moving towards the uh, COP in Edinburgh. And uh, just to, to mention that, um, or to go a bit farther, one of the things that was really amazing in the last COP, which was held in Spain, was the, that we were able to bring together the, a significant number of young people who were, uh, again, rising up, talking about what, the way to move forward on the climate change issue. And it was our executive director, actually, who is one of the strongest allies of young people. And she said, and, and she said very simply, we hear you, we must act now. And she has consistently put that forward for UN Habitat and put UN Habitat out there as a supporter of young people. And if we look at this, all the young people here, they're all kind of the lieutenants of um, Greta Thunberg. Uh, Greta Thunberg, yes, may be Swedish, she may come from the developed world, but it's not that, um, she, it's, her, it's her immense privilege that allows her to speak this. What she also has been able to do is bring together the um, and galvanize the youth movement globally. And it's, it's really quite amazing. And, and it's really interesting when she gives a solution, which I think is why so many of these young people uh, gravitate towards what she's doing. Her solution is that if the people knew, if the people could be involved, it's democracy, it's governance that needs to be looking. So she's not just saying reduce, recycle, reuse, or any of the scientific fix. She's saying it's a people fix, that we must allow the people to speak and allow them to know what is happening around climate change and they will make the choices that need to be made. Um, I, one of the, uh, another leader of ours, uh, who is who's actually a, not a youth, but an adult leader, but working with youth, is Isaac Mwasa. Uh, and he is doing, he works in the informal settlements. I think that's also, again, some, one of the more marginalized communities of the world. There's one billion people living in informal settlements and slums. They are the ones that are impacted. When you see climate change, you see um, massive, you know, like we have, uh, we have these weather, um, weather events, these, these like massive rains, uh, huge amounts of rain come in when you wet, and those impact places like informal settlements, which become rivers of sewage and mud because of the, the lack of basic services there. And so Isaac stands up for that. What we, this is a, a mural that actually was done in, uh, in uh, Nairobi, of uh, Wangari Mathai, uh, another amazing leader. And what Isaac has been able to do, and they just cre created a, um, mural about climate change that they're using to educate um, the people in his community, sometimes who are maybe less than literate and they use murals. He's also as a leader of our COVID-19, uh, um, the COVID-19 response that we've done for the last year and a half. And they use many interesting and innovative ways to get the message out on critical issues such as the pandemic and staying safe, but as well climate change. And that's, that leads into some of the work we are, we are doing. We're working with some, some groups in um, uh, globally. One of the things we're looking at is a, a large digital art for climate project, which will be launched at COP. Um, this is just an interesting kind of intersection between livelihood and climate change. Um, we're looking at digitizing uh, a lot of the uh, climate art around the world so as a way to both uh, improve the livelihoods. This is actually the International Year of the Creative Economy. So we're improving the livelihoods of young people, 
who are doing art um, and creating these digital, what we call NFTs, non-fungible uh, tokens. Um, you'd have to Google it all to, because it's quite technical. But basically, they become these unique pieces of art. And this is one I was just mentioning that Isaac and Mathari had, and his team, Mathari Environmental, One Stop, had come put together and put this uh, mural, which will now be digitized. And then they're going to use it to fundraise for the climate change programs. And it's quite uh, fascinating to see that uh, the, the, the uh, way that we're supposed supporting the creative industries, supporting those most marginalized youth uh, to do good and to do stuff on climate change. And this was actually done by um, Graffiti Girls. And that's another, again, another angle on um, young women and what leadership they're taking. Um, lastly, we are launching uh, a, a well at COP, the Young, Cl young Climate Change Makers Program. Again, you see here Leah and the work she's doing. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a partnership between UNEP, UN Habitat, a institute, an in, uh, technology institute in Canada. And again, stay tuned. We'll be telling you more about how we're doing. Um, but this is really looking at how we can enhance, how we can um, uh, support these young, young climate change makers. I think that, and I, what I want to leave <coughs> as kind of my final message here is that we see young people who have made the clarion call for the last four years, if not the last 20 or 30 years, about the, the environment, about and specifically about climate change. Everything that Greta Thunberg and the women that are the young women and men who are working with her have said has come true and is even uh, worse. There's just a report that was launched today, I believe, or yesterday by UNEP, saying that on the path that we have basically the build back better idea that we had because of what happened during the pandemic when industrialization was less and there was less climate change gases emitted that we were, could build back better and it looks like we have built back worse that we're looking at a 2.7 degree increase over the next uh decades and this is not acceptable and we will pay for it if we do not get a hold of this and so i think we have to really we're looking to these we're looking to support these young climate change makers in both their advocacy, but more important, their work in their communities and their and coming and in their in their countries to come up with solutions. And we really hope that um, in supporting these young people, that they will become the leaders. Actually, and let me correct myself. We often say that young people are not only the leaders of, today, of tomorrow, but they're the leaders of today. So we need to support these young people's leadership today. We can't, we have no time to wait till tomorrow. So again, thank you so much. Um, uh, really honored to be here. I'm sorry I can't stay too long. I'm getting on a plane, uh, but uh, it's been a uh, honor to be presenting and I look forward to, um, to hearing more how this has gone. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Doug, um, Mr. Doug Ragan. Uh, thank you so much. We are giving you a virtual round of applause for your presentation. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for the presentation. And thanks for your sacrifice. Yes, <laughs> it's um, again, it's, 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 we really want to appreciate your sacrifice. We know that it's very early in Colombia uh it's still around 1 a.m in the morning so we really really appreciate the, the sacrifice because we would like to release you after this presentation i will give five minutes to the attendees to please ask you questions or comment on your um on your presentation and then uh, you are free to leave after the that interaction comments questions ladies and gentlemen i will see with the raising of hands if you have a hand facility i know sometimes if you are using your cell phone it's not easy to raise your hand so you can just unmute briefly introduce yourself and then maybe ask a question to mr doug or comment I'll see with a show of hands or somebody to just unmute. It looks like everything was crystal clear. Uh, Mr. Zondo, over to you. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, um, uh, um, Memela, and thanks very much, uh, Douglas. Uh, I think you, you know me by now. I'm a public servant in a Tewini municipality. 
uh, responsible for long-term development planning. And, and we really appreciate all the points that we have raised, especially around energizing the youth who are already leaders of today. And, and then really, we did not to wait for them to take any position because they, they, they are already uh, taking it. So what I want to say is to appreciate the, 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 the knowledge you have shared with us and equally indicate that we will be engaging you post this uh, uh, webinar to see how could we, we strengthen the existing partnership around youth activism uh, on sustainable development agenda uh, uh, as a whole and specifically on, on climate uh, uh, resilient cities uh, as it were. Um, and uh, we will we will engage you uh, post this uh, session. We also appreciate your your colleagues. Uh, I mean uh, Juma, who are, are part that they 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 really um, uh, pressurize you to come and share with us. Even waking you up at at one o'clock in the morning, we appreciate that, and we wish you a, a safe journey further as you travel to engage other youth leaders uh, wherever you are going. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm again quite honored and you know it's a global world these days we can't uh, one o'clock in the morning one o'clock in the afternoon we have to do what we have to do and so I've been quite honored and was very happy when Juma asked me to speak uh, or suggested that I speak that I was able to do so so um, yeah, thank you and again um, more than happy at any time to support young people and, and UN Habitat as I said my executive director is a strong strong supporter of young people um, and for Leah and other people. And so, yes, um, let us work together to try to uh, make sure our planet and our people are treated justly and uh, we deal with this issue. Thank you. I do have to go Thank now. Um, I, I really apologize, <laughs> but uh, running out the door. But thank you so much. I look forward, uh, hopefully there's, uh, I'll look forward, I see it's being recorded, so I look forward to this transcription recording. But thank you so much. Thank you and all the best for the day ahead. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Another virtual round of applause, a virtual one <laughs> to Mr. Ragan. Uh, thank you, Sam. Right, we are moving right along, uh, right along, and we wish uh, the, pro the, the, the UN Habitat working with the youth uh, program. We've had some wonderful stories uh, around what Leia is doing in Uganda, what Chia is doing in Mexico, the launch of the Digital Art for Climate, uh, which is going to be launched in the um, COP during COP26 in November. Um, so we, there's quite a lot of good work that the UN Habitat is doing. Uh, so and uh, let's soldier on, colleagues. The future looks bright and promising because of the activities and actions of the young people. There is also Friday for Future in Uganda, and I know there is also a lot of good work that is being done by young people uh, in South Africa, uh, and we just want to commend each one of you uh, young leaders for that work. Without any waste of time, we are going to get our next speaker now. Uh, by the name of Nomfundo Shelembe. Nomfundo, as I indicated earlier, she is a uh, PhD candidate in the School of Agriculture, Earth and Environmental Sciences in the University of KwaZulu Natal, uh, right here in our own province in KwaZulu Natal. So, Nomfundo's current research focuses on indigenous and traditional crops in current food systems on rural and peri-urban areas. Um, so that is the theme of, uh, I mean, that is her research focus currently. And she's also a research intern within the Center for Transformative Agricultural and Food Systems at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in uh, Peter Marisberg, South Africa. And uh, within the Omgeni Resilience Project, she focuses on improving market access uh, to smallholder uh, farmers. So she's also involved in um, a flagship project of this particular district of Umgungunlovu, uh, which is also supported by the Climate Adaptation Fund, which is called Umgeni Resilience uh, Project. Uh, Nomfundo, welcome as you are about to do your presentation. So Nomfundo will not be switching on her camera. Uh, but also, also, I will invite her colleague, uh, Uto Ola Ngabeni, 
Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly, uh, who will also be chipping in to support Nomfundo's presentation. Uh, I don't know if uh, Kola would like to start or Nomfundo will start and then Mabeni will speak uh, afterwards. Over to you, ladies. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Gambu. Um, I will start. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm still currently on load shedding this side. Yes, Nomfundo, we can hear you loud and clearly. OK, I'm just sharing my screen quickly. OK, I hope everyone can see. Yes, we can see. Oh, OK. Your slides. Oh, OK. Um, once again, thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be part of this webinar. My name is Nofunda Shelembe, and I am from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. My presentation today will be about turning future climate risk into resilience. So let's jump into it. So the formal definition of climate risk in agriculture um, represents the probability of a defined hydrometeorological hazard affecting the livelihood of farmers, livestock herders, fishers, and forest dwellers. So basically climate risk is the losses actually suffered by agriculture due to climate variability. And as you may know, farmers, especially older farmers, do understand the risk and uncertainties of climate change, but to a certain extent, and they do optimize their management practices best based on their years of experience. But however, times have changed, things have shifted, so the growing demand and changing of climatic conditions and intensification warrants improved climate risk management and extreme decision support systems. So this links into the importance of youth participation in agriculture. And the fact still remains that the country requires an increase of food producers. But unfortunately, the average farmer is 62 years of age, despite young individuals of 18 to 34 years, making a third of the population in South Africa. But once again, unfortunately, agriculture has a poor image among young individuals and the sector struggles to attract youth to participate consistently. So where is the youth in agriculture and what is hindering them from participating? These are the challenges found in research. So it has been found that the youth has issues with access factors, which could be uh, production resources, finance, knowledge and information, extension, and even technology. They also lack education and career guidance and even employable skills to enter into the job market. They struggle to find and um, receive mentorship and policies are actually limiting them. There's no support for this. So all these research issues demand solutions really quick and really fast. But what has been done? So this leads me to talk about the project that my colleagues and I are currently working on, which is called the UKZNURP project. And in full, it's called the University of KwaZulu-Natal Umgeni Resilience Project. Now, this project aims to build the adaptive capacity of small scale farming communities to the impacts of, of, of the change in climate. The basis of this project is around climate change and climate adaptation and has four components, which runs in four areas, um, but mainly in Tlazuga, Swaimani and the Vulingela area. Now within these four components, my colleagues and I are more focused on the third component, which is climate smart agriculture, but I'll just give you a rundown of the other components. For the early warning systems, 
These systems are mostly designed to empower communities and households to respond appropriately to risk and reduce the risk of injury and property loss to whether it's their animals or their crops. And these early warning systems aim to decrease the number of people uh, with reduced risk to climate change uh, driven floods, storms, fires and drought. The second one is climate proof settlements, and that one really aims to build physical assets um, constructed to withstand conditions resulting from climate change. And they also aim to restore and rehabilitate target areas and improve climate resilience. So that would be your restoration of grasslands and uh, the removal of alien vegetation to prevent bush encroachment. And that's usually done or I could say that the youth uh, community members are mostly hired to do um, these type of things. Uh, the fourth one is capacity, capacity building and learning, which mostly is about increasing awareness of climate change adaptation and options to enhance climate resilience. Just to zoom in on the third components, components where my colleagues and I are working, it's about resilience through climate smart agriculture, and we do this by reintroducing or let me say introduce the high drought, high drought and heat tolerant crops such as ginger, garlic and herbs. Um, it's about investing in, 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 in crops with stable yields and good nutritional value and combining scientific methods and local knowledge. But it doesn't stop there. We also make sure that we help farmers increase their yields and access to markets, and we offer youth opportunities to participate in household small scale farming activities across five districts, namely the Umkungundlovu, Herikwala, Ugu, Umzinyati, and Eteguini. So there has been um, a few achievements or some achievements, but as you may know, these things take time. If you just look at the pictures, those are the youth gardens that we have in Swaimani. Um, these gardens um, and tunnels have been made through successful training of youth community members, which has led them to be better equipped with production skills of a variety of crops, and it has boosted their confidence actually to apply for funding and approach markets. There's also been successful linkages to markets. Um, if you just look at the pictures, uh, that is a meeting between swine money farmers um, and the head of fruits and vegetables at uh, Save Hyper. It happened in May 2021, and they were able to get, or we were able to get them an agreement uh, to supply Save Hyper with two with two um, crops, which is taro or amadumbe and sweet potato. And um, their agreement was that they're able to supply safe hyper two times a week for 200 kg per crop. So it's 400 kg per crop per week. Um, so we were able to successfully link them to the market, uh, but at the same time, we were able to promote uh, the production of underutilized and neglected crops such as taro and um, sweet potato. There's also been continuous face to face engagements um, and trainings, which has led to empowered and more self reliant farmers, which is one of the main goals of this project. Um, even during the times of COVID, information packages in the form of brochures and posters were sent to these farmers. And on top of that, we make sure that we send them climate information in the form of text messages so they are kept in the loop in the know. Another priority of this project is the formal registration of farmers in, 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 in groups which are cooperatives. And we and we may know or <laughs> we may not know, but farmers have a better chance of um, approaching markets and actually getting funding if they approach as groups because they're able to produce more and they're able to meet deadlines. So that is very important to us to assist them in registering as cooperatives. Um, another thing is that as time has got as time has gone by and the farmers have grown, uh, they are able to participate in agricultural related events 
such as the World Food Day, which happened on the 16th of October just this year. And as you can see, farmers were able to display their produce, they were able to share information among one another, they were able to talk about their challenges. So it was farmers of all ages, young and old. Uh, they were able to build one another and they were able to actually sell their produce, which was great. So um, it was really nice in this event to see the growth that has happened in the years of them being in the project and how they've shifted from subsistence farming to more of a small, small, small scale farming, hopefully one day to move into commercial farming. Another program that is happening is the citizen science program. And this program is not about youth members just attending workshops and meetings. It's about them actually having a genuine contribution and participation into scientific research. So the youth is um, hired to actually gather data for scientists or research groups in areas where they cannot be present all the time. So the program was built through the need of citizens being an integral part of managing and reducing risk caused by extreme weather events. So in the end, the youth is empowered and they are more involved in managing their risk in the long term. The aims of this program is for the advancement of local knowledge in weather, climate change projections, mitigation and resilience, and also to improve the understanding and management of water catchments among youth community members. It's also to enhance the resilience of livelihoods and aquatic systems to the impacts of extreme weather events. So in conclusion, um, I'd just like to say that projects um, and programs like these should not just uh, be ticking boxes, but aim to live an impact, which is what we want to do and, and aiming to do and trying to do. And these projects really aim to empower small scale farmers, young and old, as well as community members with knowledge and training um, in order for them to be to be more self reliant in climate adaptation. So it is encouraged for more youth community members to take charge and, and, and really participate in such projects so they can learn and 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 grow. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Numfundo, soon to be Dr. Numfundo. Uh, we are looking forward to the unveiling of Dr. Numfundo. Thank you so much. That was Numfundo, who uh, was talking on turning future climate risk. Um, so, so thank you very much for that, uh, into uh, turning future climate risk into resilience. Uh, I will give this opportunity now to Tola, and uh, need to also maybe chip in and add some information or whatever. Tola, are you there? Over to you. OK. Looks like Tola. All right, let's let's maybe move on to taking a quick discussion on Numfundo's presentation. Thank you for the great work, sterling work that you are doing uh, in the Umgeni Resilience um, Project, especially on issues of climate smart agriculture. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, issues of agriculture and food security are very much important uh, as a focus and a theme or as a sector within uh, climate change adaptation. We know that agriculture also has a contribution on issues of mitigation through the release of methane from intensive animal production, etc use of uh, nitrogen fertilizers, uh, etc. But from an adaptation point of view, the issue of food security is very much important. And empowering young people helps, you know, our communities to better adapt to the impacts uh, of climate change. So thank you for the sterling job that you are doing 
through the program as well as through issues of awareness and market creation. We are much uh, excited to understand that you are trying to move some of the small farmers from subsistence farming to small scale uh, farming, farming especially, and maybe move them in future also to, to being commercial farmers and also opening markets for them. So that is very good work that you are doing, as well as we note the citizen science program you know, where people contribute uh, through citizen science. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me give this opportunity for us to have a 10 minutes discussion. Uh, you can make make some reflections also on Mr. Dark uh, Ragan's uh, presentation. If you thought about something subsequent to him leaving the meeting and you thought, you know what, let me make this point quickly, or on Ms. Nomfundo Shellembe's uh, presentation. Over to you, ladies and gentlemen. As I indicated, you can either raise your hand if you've got a hand raising facility, or you can just switch on your microphone, introduce yourself briefly, and then maybe um, ask a question or comment. Yes, uh, Mr. Sbusisom Tunu, over to you, Matlingwana. Uh, please unmute Matungwane. Hello, Senior Zora. Yes, Senior Zora, please go oh. ahead. Oh no, thank thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you for the presentation. I I missed the first one. I only found the, the towards the end. The presentation. Did, but that was done by Unumfondo. But I, it's very impressive, you know, when you see a project of that nature. So where you actually see the end results and then the interest that people are showing towards the project. It's it's, it's really an impeccable project. So I think for me, I can just say that I can only wish her success. Noguti, I think like she can involve other sectors as well for this not just to be a project but turn into a program like a sustainable program because as it is you can see Uti, the success it's already proving that it can be a sustainable thing of which i think when we re when we refer to climate change and all the challenges that we have the problem is always sustainability Uti, what you're putting in is it going to be sustainable enough to to give you the results even tomorrow even the day after tomorrow so such a project is really impeccable and then regarding food safety and food security that there is something that touches all of us so i so wish that there can be more that can be done so that people can get to understand the concept of food security that it's about the actions that we make Tina on a daily basis that contribute to that because I think this term sometimes people look at them and then they find them to be so big they think that no it's something that doesn't affect me it affects uh, as a William Smith somewhere else or it affects Usbusi so staying in Klampem Klanga we never look at it in a close spectrum to say that no food security is something that affects me on a daily basis so i think i'm not sure I'm, I'm also to blame i always say that i'm also to blame because in our talking with people in the work that we do but i realize that no i think we're not doing enough i believe there's more that we can do as environmental practitioners as well to try and help towards driving the message here, here food security but no, thank you so much for your presentation, Ganon Fondo. Yeah, I wish you success, and uh, I truly hope that it becomes a program. Thank you, Matungwane. Okay, now thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mitkunu, for those the, uh, for that message. Uh, not sure if there was a network glitch on your side, uh, but yeah, we did get the crux uh, and your comments. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, let me request also Chola Ozama Kozuayo to take us through some of the comments that are on the chat uh, box. I can see there are some comments on the chat box. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gambu. 
I'll just go through the comments on, um, I'll start with Nomfundo's um, presentation first. Um, it's just praises for the work that she's doing and um, Mungumusa Zondo just congratulated her on the great work, which is not only looking at economic growth, but um, also covers nutritional security, to ensure nutritional security and um, healthy communities by looking at um, local production and local consumption which also helps us reduce our carbon footprint. Um, again, um, Teresa, amazing and empowering project by Numfundo, and then comments from Joash as well um, for the inspiring work and um, just for Numfundo to keep up the good work. And also again, comments from Spusiso that it's an impeccable project, phenomenal work, great work and um, good work. Numfundo, you've got someone who's um, very inspired by your work, um, Uzip, who is also doing um, honors in agriculture. So it's just um, feedback for Numfundo. Um, I'll go back up. There was also feedback for for Doug. Um, just also just thanking him for being here, and um, also again that the talk was inspirational and and really well received by the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Tola. <clears throat> thank you, Tola, for that feedback. Uh, th and thank you um, to all the participants also for commenting on the chat box. We encourage you to please use your chat box. And uh, Zippo Zondo, if you'd like to hook up with Nomfundo for knowledge exchange, for lessons exchange, please feel free to drop your email address uh, also uh, so that the two of you, you know, as, as academics, you can be able to to link up and talk about the work that you do within the agriculture space, food security space. It will be interesting also to use this webinar to create other networks, you know, with other people that you didn't know existed in your field of research or something like that. So let's use this platform also as a networking platform. Uh, great. Um, thank you so much. We're doing very well in terms of time. We are on time. Uh, for the next presentation. But before we move on to the next presenter, is there anyone who would like to raise their hand or switch on their microphone and still comment either on Numfundo's presentation or on something that comes to mind in relation to the two presentations that we've just had? Presentation by Mr. Ragan as well as a presentation by Ms. Shelembe. Namfundo, in the meantime, if you can please uh, write your contact uh, details on the chat box. I see Desiree has an interest to get your contact. Uh, please, if you are comfortable, please write that. OK, in the absence of uh, other comments or questions, um, we will then move on to our next speaker who I'm going to introduce, and she's going to correct me, Miss Martin, if I have not pronounced your, your name very well. Uh, the speaker is an applied biology student in the University of Zulu Natal, uh, in the University of Cape Town, rather. Uh, alongside her work as an international, as a national project and policy declaration lead for the South African Youth uh, Climate Action Plan. So she's really an active part of this uh, South African Youth uh, Climate Action uh, Plan. She is also a young leader under the Earth Charter uh, International. And she's a newly elected co-focal point for the Climate Change Working Group uh, within the Youth Policy Committee. Uh, which is a network of young people dedicated to engaging with climate uh, policy in South Africa. So she also interfaces with issues of climate policy. She is truly a mover and a shaker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Laika Martin. Please, uh, Miss Martin, do correct me if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. Let's give a virtual round of applause for Miss Martin, an applied biology student in the University of Cape Town. Thank you Over so to you, much. Man. Thank you so much. You did indeed. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying my name correctly. So um, I am very honored and thankful to be here today at this event that is centered around youth innovation in the climate action space. 
Um, I must excuse my camera. So if I can just keep that off because of my bandwidth at the moment, that would be great. And then I will present um, now. Um, but as introduced, I am Laika Martin. I am one of the national project and policy declaration leads um, for the SAYCAP process. And part of my responsibilities was to help coordinate the process and to jointly um, lead the formation and the structuring of the policy declaration section of the document. So um, if I can just share my presentation. So just hold on quickly. Can I just be informed that you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I will get going. So um, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like. As you can see, that my presentation will focus on um, the process of the SAY cap and explaining what that process is, and then also I'm like touching on. Um, what meaningful, um, I would say, um, 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 local action would look like um, for the implementation of such um, a process. So the policymaking space um, has and is often seen, or um, it has been and is often seen as an elusive one for young people for many, many reasons. Um, I would say that one reason would be um, a lack of knowledge and general know-how regarding the policymaking um, process. So this can include um, questions of how to properly access, analyze, and understand policy. And this can be from concepts to you know understanding the general jargon, as well as um, how to effectively contribute to the process. So how should one phrase points and recommendations correctly, and how should one engage with stakeholders, this can be one stumbling block for young people within this space. And um, I would say a follow up one to that particular um, stumbling block within policymaking is that let's say one has this knowledge, um, how is it that um, you are able to properly implement this knowledge when you're not given access to policy drafting platforms or are not adequately and fairly represented um, when you are present in these platforms? So young people have often found themselves as victims of tokenistic intent with the present sometimes deemed as a tick box activity for many stakeholders. And this can result in their views being dismissed. Um, and this kind of ties into the third point, which would be general sentiments surrounding young people and the ability to contribute to the policymaking process. So while the attitude towards young people has shifted to one, seeing them as important groups to be included within policies and plans. Being young can still often be synonymous with being seen as being naive or inept. In, I would say uh, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like quite a few societies today. And this is why the, I'm like, I'm like the SAYK process is so necessary as it is to highlight the need for genuine platforms that cater towards growing young people's abilities and capacity in policymaking processes, but also to fairly represent the views and their lived experiences within the policymaking arena. And furthermore, to place all of this within a space that desperately needs young people and the active meaningful involvement, which is in the space of climate change policy. So, while the work to enhance um, like specific um, like participation, but specifically youth um, like participation in climate action and policies really started for us at COP27 or COP17, sorry, which actually took place in Durban in recent history before the SAY cap came to be. There was a collaborative process between the city of Joburg, um, the Global Change Institute based at the University of the Witwatersrand and youth leaders to create a Johannesburg Youth Climate Action Plan. And this would later filter into the work 
of the city of Joburg's climate action plan. And it was here that young people were seen as active collaborators in the policy drafting, in the policy editing, and now the implementation process of this particular document. And they actually saw their work being included in the preamble and a dedicated chapter of the Joburg CAP. Um, and the key thematic areas within this Johannesburg YCAP um, included um, themes of intersectionality of systemic change of just transition of community focused um, spaces and initiatives of innovation as well as accessibility and sustainability. And it was this process that emphasized the need for more national youth climate action and which birthed the process of the SAY cap. So the I'm like I'm like I'm like so the SA I'm like why with the South African Youth Climate Action Plan is a process, and this is important to emphasize because the end goal of the SA YCAP was not just to launch a document, but to carry it out in its implementation and then to view the document as a foundational one that would be expanded upon, but would also serve as a guiding framework. Um, for further youth innovation. So the SAY cap can be broken up um, into two parts, um, which have been merged to form a seamless document. So the first part of the SAY cap can be seen in the policy recommendation section of the document. And um, these serve to highlight action points needed to move South Africa towards a climate resilient, sustainable, and just future. And the second part of this document was the inclusion of youth climate stories. And this was necessary, especially to be interspersed amongst the policy recommendations, because we need to amplify the voice of young people. And it was aimed to provide policymakers and stakeholders with real life accounts of the emotions and all the lived experiences um, by young people regarding climate change and its impacts. So that is essentially the structure of the document as it currently stands. It looks at both formal policy recommendations for different sectors, but it also has real climate stories in the document to amplify that youth voice. So the um, so the, I'm like I'm like the SAY cap process within 2021. I'm like it began in March and it saw the documents launch occur um, on the 1st of October. And presently we are working to expand the impact of the document and to plan the way ahead for its implementation. But I thought that it would be um, great for me to maybe give a quote frame by frame account of how exactly the SAY cap came to be. Um, so beginning in March 2021, we started the process off by hosting a two-day conference that invited all interested parties to brainstorm core ideas for the SAY cap. And some of those ideas can be seen on the screen. We had ideas of, um, you know, focusing climate action in spaces of transport or sustainable energy or advocacy or education. Um, and it was after this conference that we opened applications to create a youth-led coordinating team for this process. And this was entirely, or um, excuse me, it was utterly important to have the youth voice present um, in this way because it not only emphasized the need for youth participation, but also for youth leadership as well. And we had the youth at SAI team act as a facilitating partner in this entire process. So in May, we, um, um, like we find ourselves collectively deciding to adopt a, um, like a specific model for the SAY cap. And this model was a pillar principle model. And this meant that the pillars um, would act as overarching themes for the SAY cap and principles would act as key areas of discussion within those respective pillars. So these pillars drew from ideas that came out of the March conference and they were um, like narrowed down to five specific um, um, like, um, like pillars, which will be named further on in the presentation. 
So that is what happened in May. And then we found ourselves planning and we get to July. We, we, um, we, I'm like, I'm like commenced with hosting um, a, I'm like a specific workshop series um, that would be seen as the national climate workshops. Um, and this was catered towards young participants and focused on the various topics that came out of what we now had as a draft framework of ideas and pillars and principles. And we thought let's focus specific workshops on specific spaces that we feel needs to be supplemented with information and education because this allowed us to not only um, have young people expand on their knowledge within these areas of climate action, but to also use that knowledge then to make informed recommendations, which would then be seen um, um, happening between July and August when we had a call for um, input in the form of not only formal um, policy-like input, but also in the form of input that would be climate stories. Then in August, we thought to amplify the formal input or the call for, I'm like, I'm like for formal input that I'm like would be received by young people by having one, a high school's model legislature. And this format, which would see schools come through with um, statements and formalized um, points um, in a model um, 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 legislature format um, was aimed towards increasing input from high school learners specifically. And then together with that, we had a general input workshop that would increase input from a general youth demographic um, space. So now coming into the end of August, we um, after we had all of the input and we closed the, um, like the deadline for input, we now had to edit this process. And we opened applications for about plus minus 20 young people to join the specific editing committee that we had because this one not only enhanced or ensured transparency in the editing process, but it also grew on the, um, on the editing capacity of young people and acted as a space for them to grow. Um, the particular skills. And this carried on into the beginning of September, which um, thereafter we had a final in-person uh, like in person editing process that took place in Cape Town. And this was done with the policy declaration leads, um, as well as um, I'm like other I'm like members of the coordinating group, as well as the youth at SAI group as well. And after we had the editing draft um, be sent through to external editors, we now had a document to launch on the 1st of October um, at Freedom Park um, in Pretoria. So with the participation of over 1,000 young people who represented over 200 organizations, schools, universities, and clubs nationwide, including KwaZulu Natal, we settled on five overarching themes or pillars for the SAY gap. And this was one, intersectionality. So recognizing the intersections of identities and, you know, um, of like specific identities as well as the roles of young people and people in South Africa and how those intersect with um, climate impacts and um, I'm like, in the, I'm, I'm like the vulnerability face through climate impacts. We also had a pillar that focused on recognizing the role of advocacy and activism um, for climate change. And this delved on topics of um, climate change education. It delved on expanding spaces of, um, of indigenous knowledge systems um, and also community-based, um, I would say, um, like initiatives and dive. Then we also had a pillar that focused on good governance. So this looked at leadership, at transparency and accountability measures for governance at all spheres, be it from national, state down to local. Um, and then we had a pillar that looked at systemic change. So this touched on topics of, of a just transition, of, of waste management. It also looked at, um, at spaces of energy, um, et cetera. And then finally, we had a pillar that looked at environmental sustainability specifically, um, and it touched on topics of natural resources, of agriculture, 
as well as biodiversity and ecosystems. So as you can see, we try to allow this document to be as expansive as possible. So throughout this process, there were many trial and edit cases. In, in, I mean, some cases we truly excelled and in other cases we acknowledged, you know, shortcomings as lessons for the future. And I thought that it would be good to highlight some of those lessons throughout this entire process. And one of those lessons was truly learning the, the, the actual value of getting young people on the same page within climate policy. And this is a key takeaway that needs to be recovered. Um, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, it has to be recognized as the pivotal concept that it is. Because as we know, young people are not a monolith. So we have different lived experiences that influence our thoughts, ideas, and the way in which we see as the correct way to combat climate change. However, we can see throughout this process just how all of these intersecting identities can work together towards a greater plan. And this level of collaboration and cooperation is needed in spaces like the up and coming COP26, where leaders need to find common ground together to advance global climate action. Um, I would say another, um, a specific lesson that I would say could be seen as a struggle, but has now become something that we and many others should continuously strive for would be the struggle to consistently ensure that we create inclusive mechanisms and spaces. So throughout this entire process, oftentimes we've wondered, are we including everyone in this plan? Are we ensuring that everything is accessible, that we are representing everyone as accurately as possible? Um, and I think that if we continue to strive to think in this particular manner, in everything that we do across all industries, we will move in a positive, inclusive and equitable that I'm like, I'm like, on, on, on that direction. Um, and then finally, the last two points, which um, refer to um, young people realizing the ability to self-mobilize, but also struggling through feelings of imposter um, um, syndrome and feeling um, how exactly do you belong in this space is something that we need to mention and something that we need to highlight um, as it's strongly interlinked um, and it's strongly um, felt by a lot of young people, especially within the climate um, space. Um, and from personal experience, it is so easy to feel inadequate and ignore your ability to actually make things work. So therefore, from this entire experience, we can see that it is so important to instill within young people the belief that they are worthy and able, that their work and effort is valid, and that inadequacy is just a very bad way of saying that you have a room for growth. So after all of this, it's now important to see exactly how does national documents and plans such as the SAYCAP translate into local action and what role should municipalities and local government play in this process? And there are three things that really come to mind when I think about this, and that would be implementation, it would be monitoring as well as evaluation. So municipalities and local governments are the first points of contact when it comes to trying to implement national plans and filtering it down to the various communities and grassroots um, um, sectors. And this is critical because it is on this level, it is in this space that the true impact of plans are felt. It is on the ground where the, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like where the specific outcomes of decisions and recommendations are truly reflected. And it is here that accurate measures of change can be um, I would say observed and monitored. Um, however, as the Joburg and the South African YCAP process has shown, the room for collaboration between young people and um, specifically um, like municipalities and local government is available. It's there. It's just a question of how effective will it be. And um, this effective implementation and monitoring of climate action plans, but speaking more specifically now on the SAYCAP process, can only truly be achieved through meaningful collaboration with young people. And this means providing accessible platforms for young people to contribute the ideas, but furthermore to allow them the opportunity to play an active role in the drafting and decision-making processes that surround climate policy in South Africa. 
Um, and another point would be that the young people are both extremely knowledgeable, but may in the same breath require additional training and capacity and knowledge building. So this shows how a local action needs to be innovative and uniquely modeled to the realities and the needs of young people. And this can only be achieved through meaningful consultation and engagement with young people that shifts away from tokenistic tendencies and more on working together with them to create something great. Um, so it is therefore important that municipalities are encouraged to support the implementation of plans, but I'm like, I'm like specifically to I'm like support the implementation of the SAY cap. And we hope to see the needed collaborative and active energy from municipalities through future engagements um, for this process. So that is the end of my presentation. I hope that um, it has allowed you to um, understand a bit more of the work of the um, like, of, like, of the SAY cap, the work that we have done, as well as the road that we still have to travel. But as a closing remark, I will definitely leave you with this one line is that often success requires at least one person in the room to be willing to listen. And I urge everyone present on this call in every space that you find yourself in to be that one person. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Laika. Thank you so much for the presentation on the road you have traveled. Uh, in the development of the SAY cap and uh, also all those uh, colleagues and young people in particular were involved in the development of the plan as well as the road of course that is still remaining ahead we have actually understood how the process has developed from COP17 to the Joburg uh, Y cap and from the Joburg Y cap to the SA uh, Y cap, you know, and the road you have traveled from March until now in October with all the engagements that have been involved in the development of the plan. I have been been empowered, you know, um, I really must admit I wasn't aware of this great work that is being done uh, in our country. And we just want to congratulate everyone involved in this particular process and also the challenge you have um, given especially to municipalities to say okay now let us move beyond the plan now to implementation because it's good to have um you know good plans sitting on shelf number 12 but it, it it's it's not good actually i'm, I'm saying it's good it's it, it's not good to have plans sitting on shelf number 12. we need to say what is it that we can extract from the plan now and 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 then be able to categorize as short-term deliverables medium term and long-term deliverables and what can we consider as low-hanging fruits and begin to say okay let us implement some of those low low-hanging uh, actions that are contained in the plan at municipality level together with young people because somebody said nothing about uh, about us uh, without us so we need young people to work with as uh, we implement uh, as municipalities some of the actions contained in the plan well done to the team and i have been informed that there are also other members uh, of uh, the SAY cap development process who are in the room can i give this opportunity to them if there are other members who are somehow involved in the development of the south african youth climate action plan please feel free to also raise your hand or unmute and maybe make some additions in terms of your own lessons learned, your own experience in the whole process of development. I am so fascinated by the fact that our young people are part of the climate uh, policy development process. It's really encouraging and I can say that in terms of the climate change uh, discourse, the future looks bright because you guys are already involved in climate change work, even at a, uh, a policy level. So thank you so much also for sharing the lessons learned, uh, particularly fascinated by the fact that the struggle to consistently create inclusive mechanisms and spaces continues. So we need to begin to say, let us strengthen those inclusive mechanisms and create spaces for young people to, to be actively involved within the climate change space. So can I give this opportunity to other members of the SAY CAP development process to chip in also? and they have their say if there are anyone 
I've put comments on the chat box just in case people want to see, but that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Desri. Thank you also for the link uh, to the SAY cap. It's been um, included in the in, in the chat box, and uh, we want to thank you for that, Desri. Um, Yes, I am. Another comment from uh, Mr. Zondo is that the key question we need to address is how to leverage youth dividend for the implementation of sustainable development agenda for today and tomorrow. I think it's a very good question that you are raising, Mr. Zondo, uh, and he feels that it's very important and it has to extend to the political leadership so that we are able to leverage that uh, youth dividend and uh, for for particularly implementation um we do need we do need that uh, i'm not sure if mr sondo you've got ideas that came after you wrote the question or somebody would like to comment on that particular question how do we address that uh, question um yes mr sondo over to you um, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Tabani. What a what a, what a great, uh, inspiring presentation from from all presenters. Um, and of course, I would commend on the on the last one for now. Um, really, we 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 must appreciate that the youth are leading today. They are not waiting for 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 tomorrow. They are already already leading. And again, in in our case, uh, as a city or a city of Etewin or Etewin municipality. Uh, last time I checked, uh, our municipality of about 3.4 to 3.6 million people, 42% of those are below the age of 35. So in, in essence, that it, it simply means that we, we have got an opportunity here that we, we mustn't uh, really lose. You know, that's why I'm talking about the, the youth dividend. The youth we are talking about, they are not a liability, but they are an asset. They're an asset that we, we need to, to fully leverage the likes of, of, of you and me, maybe Tabani, it's time that we may as well take a little bit of a backseat and, and do some mentoring and coaching, but allow also to unlearn some of the things we have learned in the past that are not uh, useful and maybe share those that are useful to the youth that shall then lead us moving forward. I mean, political equal leadership, because I think, I mean, I don't know. If, if anybody has been following the campaigns for the election, I mean, I have never had uh, any any of the leaders. Of course, I'm talking about the 62 year olds who are already on retirement age, but leading the country as it were. Uh, but I have never heard them talking about the vulnerability that, that we are likely to experience and continue to endure as a result of, of climate change, except by, by, by the way, a comment on climate change. And then and yes, as climate change is, by the way, comment, you know, rhetoric comment on it. So I think it is a time that the youth really uh, take us to a future that we, we all could really be certain that it is a better future within the context we are living in. 